What is going on, guys? Welcome to episode 17 of Delver of Standard. Today we've got a little bit of a mixed bag. We've got a look ahead at the Arena Championship 3 this weekend. Don't forget it's this weekend. Wizards isn't going to remind you very well. Um, and then we've got a little bit of a chat prior to Monday's ban reveal list. So let's get, dive in right away. So the Arena Championship 3 standard metagame breakdown has been revealed. Players have had to register their decks for this weekend's event. Uh, very exciting. Arena Championship 1 and 2 were really fun to watch. I'm hoping that this one, they'll continue to kind of grow uh, on their production value and the commentary was great last time just a few hiccups so hopefully they're still working on improving all of that stuff uh the only real thing to go over is the meta game meta game breakdown um i believe there's only 30 people invited to this 32 players are on this ticket so that's why you'll see a pretty low deck count number even for the higher stuff um but right off the bat we see uh rakdos midrange at number one here uh that's kind of self-explanatory that is something we kind of expected uh there's a lot going right for rakdos midrange right now and prior to monday's ban and restriction list um you know, Rakdos is still the most powerful thing on the market. Really interesting to see that Jeskai Dragons has bumped up to second place on the uh, metagame list at 15% with five decks registered. This is that really cool uh, Zergo and Ojitai uh, combo kind of... It's almost control -y. Um it's, it's a very fun list. Definitely suggest you check it out. Uh, the five color ramp with Atraxa and um, domain, a little bit of domain control is up there. Grixis Reanimator, again, we've got Cruelty of Gix, um, Corpse Appraiser, probably Atraxa, Atali in there as well. Um, Selesnya Enchantment, which is really fun that that is kind of returning back to that first. Again, they've only got two decks registered uh, under Selesnya Enchantments, but still. Um, that puts it in the top 6%. Rakdos Breach, which is something that a lot of the big teams at Channel Fireball tried out at the Pro Tour and didn't really go so well. They played all right, but um, it was a kind of a coin flip as to whether or not they won or lost. So the Rakdos Breach deck, which everyone thought could be really powerful, um, is kind of middling out right now. Uh, we'll wait and see if players start to, to get more behind it. Uh, if the win rate rises, if it does well in the Arena Championship, we're obviously going to see more of those decks pop up. And then post Monday's ban announcement, uh, something like Rakdos Breach might be uh, something interesting to look at. Uh, Grixis Midrange uh, only has two decks as well registered on... Uh, the constructed meta game, and then you know we've got one of Borza Boros mid range, Orzov mid range. These are the kind of semi successful decks at the Pro Tour. Um, Azorius Soldiers only has one deck representing it at the tournament this weekend. It's really powerful. There's a lot of knight and soldier um, synergies in standard right now so it's very powerful but it's just not quite seeing the success that uh other decks are seeing mainly because they don't include stuff like fable and invoke despair um and then mono white aggro at the very bottom of the list again with one deck registered mono white has seen a lot of um cards being introduced that kind of hate its play style so it's it's a lot more difficult to get the mono white um through the finish line that game one still has a lot of powerful um swing to it for the mono white aggro deck but game two after sideboards there's a lot of really powerful stuff that uh, can come in and really disrupt that deck so that's a look at the meta game the, the biggest surprise really is the Jeskai Dragons. I'm excited to see some deck lists from this um, to find out 
We've got Invasion of Gobakan and Zergo and Ojitai are up here. It's the new Splinter Twin, one of the Jeskai Dragons players excitedly told me. Best deck I've had in years, they said. Wow. Okay. I'm very excited to see how that plays. Um, again, this is going on this weekend, um, starting on the 27th, so tomorrow at 9 a.m., and then running until Sunday, um, and it'll be on Twitch TV dot twitch.tv slash magic if you want to check that out uh the next thing i wanted to bring up was that going back to this revitalizing standard article that we talked about um they're trying to to breathe more life into this format and i think it deserves it standard is my favorite format obviously i talk about it every other week on this youtube channel um i think it's it's really fun to kind of play within bounds and always kind of be on a rotating um standard list of cards so it's it's my favorite other than maybe limited uh, it's my favorite play style for sure um and and they're trying to to bolster it by reshaping the way that they design cards but also like extending the rotation a bit so you've got a bigger card pool and that way more cards and more synergies uh, more mechanics and archetypes can kind of come to the surface um and one of the things that they mention in this deck is that there is going to be a restriction and ban announcement on Monday, which is the 29th. Um, that being said, they have not mentioned anything about what the ban list will be. So we've kind of, thanks to the help of Moxfield, if you don't follow or use Moxfield, I highly suggest it. We are not sponsored by them. I would love to be one day. Moxfield is my favorite tool on the internet for magic. Uh, you can build decks, store your collection, you can play test. Um, they're eventually going to come out with like a Twitter feed kind of social media integ integration as well. So Moxfield is my favorite. I, I love them. I highly suggest you check them out. Um, so what we've done really is we've taken the 12 most popular, most unabashedly ugly cards and we're going to decide what we think is going to be banned on Monday. This is all speculation. And some of this comes from where I'm sitting, my perspective, my opinion. So to take this all with a big grain of salt, I just wanted to have this conversation and kind of look at what I would consider cards that should be banned on um, Monday. What I'm going to do is um how do i edit primer there we go so i'm gonna paste i have this little note here i tried to sit down and think like how what what goes into banning a card how do i from a player's perspective decide whether or not a card should be banned so i came up with three simple questions simple ish three good questions now if two of them are yes and one of them is a no, then I think it should be considered. If three of them are a yes, then it should be banned, no questions. If one of them is a yes, then I think that it shouldn't be banned. Um, and if none of them are a yes, then obviously it should be left alone. But these are my three questions. Um, basically, is it toxic? So do players immediately feel like the game is over when it hits the battlefield slash gets played? Or do people feel like they can deal with it, but must deal with it? So powerful cards are going to exist in Magic forever. The design team is not going to stop making powerful bangers of cards. So, But a lot of them can be dealt with. They're obviously cards that need to be dealt with, otherwise you will lose. But some of them are almost impossible to deal with and they give off this toxic feel bad moment where your opponent plays it um you know if, if you're unfortunate enough to have a poor opponent then sometimes they can make you feel bad just by the things that they say or the way that they act towards you after they've played it knowing that it's going to be very difficult for you to overcome the adversity of this card or combo 
Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, is it a must include? Do players feel like it's forced upon them to play these cards when building a deck in a certain color combination? If you remove this card from the pool of standard, would it spur on a more diverse deck design than is currently present? And so this is really important because there's there are good cards and then there are cards you can't afford not to play. It's like playing black in non-rotating formats and not playing thought seize. You should at all times play four thought seizes if you play black. It's too powerful. It gives you too much of an advantage and it's devastating to play against at times. So it's like that. Is it a must include? And then the last one is, are they the feature? So some powerful cards um, are really good, but they're kind of just the supporting cast to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, you know, they're the, the Ant-Man rather than the Captain America. And they're really strong, really powerful. A lot of people love them. A lot of people build synergies around them, but they're not the win condition. They're more of the tool to get there or the ability to stave off uh, death until you get there. So that's the third question. Is it a win con or is it just support? Because really, at the end of the day, no support cards should be banned because they're not the end all be all. They're just helping you get there, regardless of if they're great or poor. Um, a lot of the mid range cards can kind of straddle this line because you're trying to sustain yourself for a little while. So that's with that said, I'm going to save this so that it's always there. We're going to go back to the deck list and we're just going to go through these 12. These are 12 cards that are the most played, often considered the most powerful and are um, for the most part, fairly expensive as well. So another huge barrier in uh, standard is that, you know, when you come back to standard or you try to get into the top deck in the meta game you're looking at spending a lot of money um you know atraxas are 30 to 40 dollars atalis are still fairly cheap uh shieldreds are almost a hundred dollars um you're looking at some pretty expensive pieces um and some of them drop in popularity obviously but um you can't spend less than a hundred dollars on the best decks because some of them get so expensive because they're included in every single deck so let's go through the the list of cards and we'll move the cards that we think should be banned into the main deck these 12 are the 12 we're considering today one sec i just need a sip of water so first up is atraxa now personally immediately move it to the ban list. I ran up against this card in Pioneer tournaments the week it was released, and I had nothing but poor interactions with the people playing them. Um, obviously, a lot of that is their responsibility uh, as good sportsmanship and, and players of Magic the Gathering, but it all kind of tainted this really bad feeling. Um, but we, we need to give it a fair shake and go through the list of questions. Um, one, is it toxic? Does it feel bad to have this played against you? The, the answer is clearly yes. It's, it's very difficult. If you play this on Arena, where it's very easy to concede, almost always people will just concede if you've managed to cast an Atraxa, especially if you cast it straight up for mana. That, that's a real feels bad. Um, it's also something that sure can be killed, um, but it does dodge a handful of really good removal and can be brought back really easily. Um, the fact that it has flying, vigilance, death touch, and lifelink makes it an absolute tank. Not to mention the fact that you most of the time get to draw four or five cards off of it, off of the enters the battlefield trigger. Um, 100% this card is absurd in design and players obviously found many ways to make it playable um, 
and it is in it is in consideration in almost every single deck and i think that um is it a must include no i don't think it's a must include it's obviously included in a lot of decks um but you know most of the time you're not worrying even about casting it outright so you're not worrying about having green white blue black mana you're just going to resurrect it or cheat it out somehow um and so it's not a must include but it is one of the it's probably the most potent end game end game cards in magic right now period and i think for that um they are the feature so for question number three they're the feature they are the end game the win con the almost insurmountable mountain to climb for your opponents um and for that reason i think that you know atraxa should be on the ban list i don't mind running up against this card in older formats um you know there's a lot of really powerful stuff in older formats commander obviously this is a cool card for commander uh but i don't think it should be in standard i think it sways too much of the uh deck building and the conversation and is very very difficult to play against and it makes it very hard to enjoy playing magic the next up is blood tithe harvester i straight up off the bat is this toxic no i don't think that people want to deal with blood tithe harvester but we're not talking about something that makes you go oh no they played that on turn two i'm done for like it's just something that you need to control a little bit make sure that people don't have you know non-summoning sick blood tithe harvesters with a bunch of blood tokens because then they can kill anything you play um you know it's it's a very good support card uh is it a must include i think you should include blood tithe harvester i, I do believe blood tithe harvester is a must include if you're playing black and red whether you're playing sacrifice whether you're playing mid-range whether you're playing reanimator i think blood tithe harvester is the best to drop in those colors and you would be sorely mistaken for not putting it on your deck list uh, but they're also not the feature they are 100 percent a support card and they're always going to be a support card so i don't think that blood tithe harvester is enough of a um problem for us to include it here so we're gonna go ahead and just remove that um and then we've got Atali, the Primal Conqueror. Now, this is a new addition to Standard with the March of the Machine deck, but it has a lot of um, Atraxa flavor to it. So the nice thing about Atali is that even though the Enters the Battlefield trigger can be very powerful, it can miss. Whereas Atraxa's Enter the Battlefield ability isn't as missable you're still gonna get a couple of cards off of it maybe even one card but it's your choice almost you have a a wide swath to choose from um so even when atraxa does miss which it very rarely does um you're still going to be able to pick up one or two cards uh, at the very least um so far no one is playing atali in order to transform it and get that poison damage through so that the backside of it even though it's very scary isn't really relevant in standard right now and atali is something that you can kill um fairly easily i guess seven seven is a lot of damage like you can't cut it down um but this is worth removal uh go for the throat is a big piece of removal right now um and this kills a tally um yeah i think they aren't necessarily the feature either they maybe they are maybe you can and include it in as the feature is it toxic i don't think it is i don't think it feels as bad to play against a tally especially in a scenario where it like whiffs and the card they get from you is something minor and the card they get from themselves is something minor or one of them is good and the other one's not that good um i think that 
there's a chance it feels fine and you're just like, oh, I have to kill this 7-7 with Trample. It doesn't have lifelink. It doesn't have vigilance. It doesn't have death touch. Um, it's not flying. It just has, tra it's just a big body with Trample um, that has, an, has a cool ability that could or could not be really good for whoever plays it. It's not game breaking. And for that reason, I think that Atali should stay. <clears throat> Uh, next up is, you know, the one on everyone's tongue. It is Fable of the Mirror Breaker. This was a card that people kind of weren't paying attention to when Kamigawa came out uh, last year. And I think that, you know, it slowly picked up steam and eventually became a card that is literally in every deck in every format. Uh, Fable of the Mirror Breaker has to be one of the most played cards in Magic's history. Um, does it feel toxic to play against? No, I do not believe it feels toxic to play against. I love, we've been playing against it for so long that a lot of people hold up counter magic on turn when you're passing to your opponent for turn three. Um, it's not that difficult to deal with the shaman. It's also not that difficult to deal with the flip side when it does reach that third chapter. Um, so I don't believe it's toxic, but it is a must include. So number two on our questionnaire is, is it a must include? Um, I'm gonna put Blood Tithe Harvester back on here so that I can see what I have and have not. Oh, maybe I'll move them to the sideboard. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Let's move the non-ban to the sideboard and the ban to the main board. Okay, so Fable is a must include. If you're playing red, you have to play Fable. Otherwise your deck is significantly weaker than other decks playing it and other decks not playing it. Uh, it is one of the most powerful cards in red. It's one of the most powerful cards ever made. It's not broken. It's just really, really, really good. And because mid-range is all the rage right now, um, due to cards like Fable of the Mirror Breaker, I think that Standard needs a break from the Mirror Breaker. And I would say that they are on the chopping block. I think F Fable should be banned uh, in Standard. Invoke Despair is another really popular one. Straight up, um, you know, it sucks to get invoked and it's it doesn't feel good to lose that life or watch your opponent draw that many cards or you know lose your best creature or your only creature and your planeswalker and yada yada but um it's not easy to cast it's sorcery speed um and it almost never ends the game unless you're obviously nathan stoyer and you're playing in the world championships um you know, Invoke Despair is a really good card. It's played in a lot of decks that include black, but I don't think it, I don't think it's actually on any, I don't think it says yes to any of the uh, questions. Is it toxic? No, I don't think so. It does feel bad a little bit, um, but it's not something you can't come back from. Is it a must include? No, I don't think it's a must include. I think people are just including it uh, because of the popularity swing, seeing it played on the main stage so much. Um, if you remove this card from standard, would it spur on more diversity? No, because I think it's got a really ugly casting cost. I, I don't think people are going out of their way to be able to play it. And are they the feature? Obviously not, no. Um, it's it's really difficult to feature a sorcery something that's not a permanent um as as a dex kind of win condition um invoke despair is a great tool very powerful but it's just a tool i think uh invoke despair lands in the sideboard to not be banned because it is a support card next up is plaza of heroes this is a very crucial time for plaza of heroes there's a lot of legendary creatures out there very powerful ones including ones that we've already put on the ban list and put on the do not ban list um and obviously plaza of heroes has made decks like esper legends possible you'll notice that in that list of arena championships breakdown 
Um, there is not a single deck of Esper Legends on this metagame. Not a single one. Um, which is interesting. So, do I think Plaza of Heroes is a really powerful card? Yes. Is it toxic to play against? No, I think it's just something you have to play around. Utility lands don't tend to be super toxic. Um, other than... Uh, oh, what was the... What was the snow one that they banned? Um, Faceless Haven. Other than Faceless Haven, which can get a little toxic... Um, I don't think utility lands can be that toxic. Obviously, it's really good if you're playing a lot of legends, but it's almost useless if you're not. Um, I don't think it's strong enough to be included in the ban list. Now, Rafine Se Scheming Seer is another question altogether. Um, it is very powerful. It's only a three drop. It's, tr it's difficult to cast. Is it toxic to play against? No. I don't think it is. I think that it's fairly easy to deal with on turn three if they play it. Turn four, if they pass to you on turn three, you have enough for a removal spell plus to play the pay the ward. Um, is it really powerful? Yes. Do I think that it controls games or ends games? No. Do I think it's a must include? Also no. I think that you should include it. It's a very powerful card, um, but it is fairly easily dealt with. You can't have more than one of them on the battlefield. It's a little bit tricky to cast. Um, and, you know, it's just flying ward one as its keywords, so it's not even that scary on its own. Um, I don't think Rafine Scheming Seer should be banned. Rank Rankiner. Reckoner Bankbuster. Now, everyone is talking about putting Bankbuster on the bans list, and I, for the most part, agree with them. Um, I think it hits one of our questions. I think it's a must include. I think that if we're looking at cards, this is the most popular card being played in standard by a large margin because it's colorless. It can be played in any deck, so therefore... You should have multiple copies in your decks. Um, it has utility. It gives you card draw. Eventually, you can use it as a 4-4 attacker. You get a treasure from it. You get a pilot from it. Um, this is the most mid-range of mid-range cards ever designed, ever to be printed. And it is very, very popular. I quite love Reckoner Bankbuster. But I do think that removing it from the equation will spur on more diversity in the utility, artifacts, vehicles, conversation, and archetypes. Um, so I do think that removing Reckoner Bankbuster is a valid thing. Next up, we have Shieldred the Apocalypse. Now, this is one of those tricky cards. So I think that... Is it toxic to play against? No. Do you feel like the game is over when your opponent plays it? You do not. It's a low enough creature, 4-5, that you feel like you can deal with it. It's fairly easy to get rid of. I think where it kind of gets messy in whether or not I think it should be banned is in those last two. Is it a must include? Yes. Um, if you're playing black, you should play Shieldreds as many copies as you can afford. Again, they're a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars each right now. Um, are they the feature? Yes, ish. I think Shieldred is a great game closer for mid range decks. It is not a bomb per se, it is a fantastic game closer. Um, if you need to recoup from a poor early game, it is a great tool to get back into the conversation. Um, but it's only four mana to cast, and it has way more than four mana worth of power. I think if this was a 3-4 or a 2-4 with Death Touch and all of the abilities, I think that would be much more manageable. Um... 
I just think as, as much as I don't want to put something that can be dealt with so easily um, on the band list, I think that there's, I think the design of this card is so far unbalanced that it needs to be removed so that people don't think that they have to play it. And with the cost of it, um, money wise, not um, mana wise, the cost of it and the rarity of it, I think it's doing the wrong thing for standard. Um, I think it's way too overtuned, and I think that Shieldred the Apocalypse should be banned. Um, even though I'm literally like just making my cards invalid. Um, I love Shieldred. I love Bankbuster. Fable, I like. It's I have a playset of them. I play them in my standard deck, uh, but that's because I have to. I don't think I would play them otherwise. Um, whereas Shieldred and Bankbuster, you know, we're looking at a situation where I'm putting cards I adore on this band list. So if you are concerned that maybe I'm putting too much of my own opinion into whether or not they should or should not be banned, um, don't worry because I'm putting stuff I love on there. The next one is Cruelty of Gix. Now, this is one that hasn't been brought up a lot in conversation, um, mainly because the play number is not as high as a lot of these other cards. Um, but I think that it should be part of the conversation. I think that for five mana, Cruelty of Gix is way too much. I also think that Standard is one of those game types that uh, should reduce or minimize or completely eliminate all ability to tutor um, from the game completely. I think that being able to search your library for a card and put it into your hand, even though you're losing three life, is is way too much. Um, I think Cruelty of Gix is too powerful to make playing against it easy or fun. I think it's a must include in games in decks that play black or decks that play reanimator strategies or decks that play sacrifice strategies um, or even mill strategies. I think if you're not playing Cruelty of Gix in your mill deck, uh, I think you're missing out because you're going to mill your opponent and then get access to their best thing. Um, are they the feature? I don't know that they're the feature. I think that. The, you, you could argue that it is the headline act, um, but I think this is more of a tool to get the headline act than the feature itself. So I would put Cruelty of Gix in, an, in a pool on its own in the exorbitant, ridiculous support class. Um, but I do think it hits the mark on those first couple of points, so much so that I would suggest it to be banned. I think, again, um, standard magic should be very careful with the types of tutors and the ability to cast tutors. Um, and I think that this was the, the, the design of this card was just way too overtuned. It's super powerful and people took a while to get um, become aware of it. And I think it's too it's too powerful and people are starting to use it for the amazing card that it is and they should ban it before it gets out of hand and we have to wait for another banning um, session the next up is the wandering emperor um, so this is a an interesting one because this is almost a must include if you're playing any sort of control in standard right now it's also a very good include if you're playing white pretty much at all um and again it's on that cheap uh really powerful abilities kind of spectrum the only the the problem is is that it's not toxic so to answer the first question is it toxic no i don't think so you can deal with it um you can play around it is it a must include e yes i would say yes if you're playing white um you should at least consider including it for sure. If you're playing control or you're playing aggro, um, it is a must include. Absolutely. Um, so much so that 
if you're playing control, you should play white just so you can play Wandering Emperor. Um, and it comes with a lot of other things. White has a lot of really good control right now, but I think that's the main focus from white control. Um, and are they the feature? No, I don't think so. I think they're support. Um, I think that the Wandering Emperor seems really scary. The flash ability and the ability to play the Wandering Emperor and immediately use one of its abilities is very daunting and it can feel bad a little bit uh, playing against it. But people only really use it for the one ability. People flash it out and minus to it to um, exile tap target creature, gain two life. Um, almost always the Wandering Emperor is killed the next turn, if not the turn after. Um, very rarely are we seeing people put counters on things um, or make 2-2 two -two White Samurais. I think the even the mid-range matchups move a little bit too quickly for the Wandering Emperor to make a lasting impact on the battlefield. It's basically just used as a removal spell. And for that reason, I think that it should remain off the ban list um, and then I think let's take a look at the wedding announcement. So wedding announcements is one of those powerful enchantments. It does a lot. You get a lot. Um, you know, you potentially get card draw, you get creatures, and then if you manage to flip it, it becomes a, an anthem where all of your creatures get plus one, plus one, not of a specific type, just all of them straight up. And I think that that makes it very powerful. The The reason why it's not on a Fable of the Mirror Breaker level is because it just does its thing on its own autonomously. And all of the advantages you get are tiny advantages that really the only snowballing you get from wedding announcement type effects is if you have more than one wedding announcement. If you have three four wedding announcements then it'll be very difficult for your opponent to um, get over that mountain uh, but one wedding announcement on its own considering the um, variety of removal that we have at our disposal in standard right now i don't think wedding announcement is threatening enough to your opponent um, to even be considered really on the ban list at all um it doesn't feel terrible to play against because it's fairly easy to deal with. Um, is it a mu It's not a must include for all decks playing this color. It doesn't persuade very many decks to include this color just to include it. Um, and they're definitely not the feature. They are support card uh, 100%. So for all of those reasons, I will put Wedding Announcement in the sideboard. Um, so this is... Copy section to clipboard. Okay. So this is where we wind up. Um, I've got five really powerful cards um, on the ban list. And I've got seven out of 12 on the no ban list. Obviously, we're looking at cards that, um, you know, are really strong support cards like Blood Tithe or tools like Invoke Despair or Wedding Announcement or Wandering Emperor. I don't see much difference between stuff like Wandering Emperor and Invoke Despair. It's tools, their removal. Um, they don't blow up and end things. Um, and then on the ban list, I think we've got Atraxa. Atraxa and Cruelty of Gix are way, and Shieldred actually even, is, are just way too overtuned. Um, they've got too much going for them they're too powerful and it's forcing a stalemate in creativity in the standard environment where people are tr just trying to find ways to include and make use of these cards better instead of trying to find ways uh, around them or to do other things um, and so for, th for that reason uh, i've included them on what i think should be the ban list um Again, the announcement is coming from Wizards on Monday, the 29th. So we're very excited. After the Arena Championships, 
uh, we will get the new ban and restricted list. Uh, stuff like Fable, the Mirror Breaker has been too big uh, for too long, and I think Standard needs a break from stuff like Fable and Reckoner Bankbuster. They're very good cards, very good cards, and they're must includes. Sure, they're not toxic to play against, and yes, you can deal with them, um, but if they've become synonymous with standard, some of them, even Fable the Mirror Breaker has become synonymous with just red. Like you have to play Fable if you're considering playing red um, across all formats. And I think that that is something that putting it on the ban list for standard makes standard have a different environment than the rest of the non-rotating formats. And I think that that's part of the machine that gets more people into standard as a format is ensuring that nothing in standard feels like the non-rotating formats um yeah so that's that's it tell me in the comments below what you think shout out to that really loud motorcycle outside um tell me in the comments below what you think about this ban restriction uh list that's coming on monday what do you think of my list what, what would you change is there anything i didn't even include on this list um that you would have me consider or wizards consider i'm not actually going to be banning anything um do you agree with anything do you harshly disagree let me know in the comments below and thank you so much for watching this um i love making these and I continue to make new friends and talk about magic online uh, so thank you so much. If you haven't yet, I would love it if you could subscribe to our channel. We're trying to get that number up a bit. Share it. Um, give it a thumbs up. Uh, whatever you want to do, I'm down for. Just say hello. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope all of your opening hands are keeps. And I hope all of your opponents mulligan. I will catch you guys on the next one. Also, go watch the Arena Championship. <laughs>